Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Ruby System Library through Zoom. Um, we are very excited to have with us this evening, uh, Ethan Proud. Uh, Ethan is a local author who lives in the Pagosa Springs area. And um, welcome, Ethan. Um, Ethan, what can you tell me about Pinedale, Wyoming? Uh, Pinedale, Wyoming is a lot like Pagosa. It's around 7,200 feet. Um, it's a lot colder though. Winter runs seven to sometimes nine months out of the year. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't hit 80 until August. So that's a, was a bit of a shock for me when I came down here and it hits 80 in uh, late June, early July. And then in August it starts to hit 90 degrees. Um, it's a small town as well though, but it, uh, has 2,000 people in it compared to Pagosa Springs, 5,000 wow. year-round residents, if you count the PLP away, and 15,000, you know, residents in the entire county. Yeah. So what brought you from Pinedale to Pagosa Springs? Um, I was applying for jobs my last semester of college, and I tried to apply to five jobs a day and I stumbled across this one since I had been a um, seasonal weed and pest technician at the weed and pest district back home and thought that this would be a really good fit. Um, when I first applied, I saw that Archlita County was on the border with New Mexico and I was a little concerned it was gonna be a desert. But yeah. um, once I started researching the area, I was pretty pleased that they had all the mountains and lakes and uh, of course the ski area. And I'm from Eastern Idaho, so I'm roughly familiar with uh, the landscape of Wyoming, but um, how much did that landscape, the Wind River Mountains, um, inspire you to, to set the landscapes of some of your books? Um, I'm pretty attached to the whole mountain town kind of setting. So within the Rebellion Trilogy, there's a mountain range called the Shadow Caps that was uh, taken pretty much from, you know, uh, the view from our backyard of the Wind River Range yeah. and uh, you know just all like there's a lake called Ice Keep that is inspired by Fremont Lake back home um, and then in my writing today I still I mean now I have the San Juans as some added inspiration but um, I really can't get away from writing things outside of that mountain setting. Yeah if you could go back in time or if you could transplant some of your elementary through high school teachers to us right now, uh, what would they say about um, your finished works? You have um, five, um, five books, um, which what is really a book and a half with C bound in it. And I'll get to that yeah. in a little bit, but um, would they be surprised that you're such a prolific author? or did you start your writing really early? Um, I started my writing really early and for the most part uh, my high school and middle school teachers I didn't write too much in elementary school other than what they prompted us sure. but I did write in little journals on sporting trips because uh, me and my two brothers we always had to travel to see the other one doing sports and we were all in different age groups so I started writing then but not really uh, to the notice of any of my teachers, but in middle school, um, Tracy Hughes was a teacher who really encouraged my writing. Um, and then up and in, even into college, I had a professor who read the Rebellion Trilogy and was impressed with it. Um, so I think that they would be, most of them wouldn't be too surprised. I did have one teacher, we had to write down our goals for college and afterwards. And I said that I wanted to run college track and, um, write books and she said that both were kind of hard so I should probably have a backup plan which I guess she's right because I'm the weed and pest supervisor now so I have a day job um, but so she might be a little bit more surprised but she was still supportive just maybe a little bit more of a realist. Sure. What inspired you to actually sit down and write the Rebellion Trilogy? I know you uh, co-authored it with your brother uh, Lincoln um, but where did the impetus come from to actually sit down and start drafting this universe of characters and landscapes and, and um, the history with all of that? Um, so we'd actually been writing together for a while. I mean, most of our stories would wrap up an entire story arc in like 
30 pages or less so they weren't very good um but we had always been fans of like lord of the rings and uh aragon and other like high fantasy trilogies so yeah. we just kind of mess around and it was mainly just on road trips that we'd uh either draw characters up or um write like little introductions and kind of bounce ideas off of each other like that um and then when i was in the seventh grade i kind of got the idea for a scene that happens in the middle of the rebellion trilogy and i sat down and wrote the introduction that would kind of start to that and then uh my older brother liked it and so he kind of created a character that would parallel so rebellion was actually supposed to be two books focusing on two characters who kind of intersect in the middle and then split apart but we decided to do it as one book with alternating chapters to cover the two main characters right um and we actually got about 60 pages into that thought it wasn't very good and deleted it but luckily we were able to retrieve it from the recycling bin because <laughs> after a couple of days uh we realized that we actually had something pretty good going there yeah and so you sort of already answered this in that um, writing a book, I think for most author, authors is rarely you start at page one and then you just finish all the way through. Um, but I actually counted the pages. The entire Rebellion trilogy is over 880 pages and all five of your books is a little over 1700 pages. So that's a lot of imagination on paper, a lot of thought and, and work hopefully fun work. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, as an author, do you ever encounter writer's block? And what advice would you give to aspiring authors when they encounter that? Is that something foreign to authors or, excuse me, or do you have techniques to overcome any, any writer's block that you ever encounter? Um, so if I encounter a real writer's block where I can't write anything um, or I'm not really invested in the story, I usually just go outside and go hiking, climbing, snowboarding, or one of my other hobbies. And that's kind of where I end up coming with, coming up with more of my inspirations. Usually when I'm outside, I don't have a notepad handy to write anything down on. Um, and for other writer's block, when you have like a good story going that you, you want to write it, um, just sit down every day and write a little bit or at least open that document and look, you know, even if you get a sentence out, it's more than you had before and kind of forcing yourself to write, um, even if it's just a little bit, it's going to kind of train your creative muscles to write more and write better. Um, the Rebellion Trilogy took uh from seventh grade until my sophomore year of college to finish it all and oh. rebellion took in seventh grade into senior of high school to finish and revise and then each successive book took less time vengeance took two years um and onslaught took about uh nine months so as you just keep writing, you kind of get better at honing your craft and you kind of know where you're going to take the story. Even if you have a bit of a creative lull, you know how to get there. Sorry, I had some feedback there. Um, yeah, um, I think I've had professors tell me that if, if you don't think that writing is a laborious process or a time consuming process, then you're doing it wrong. And that doesn't mean that it's not fun, but it's, uh, I think it's rarely a quick, a quick endeavor. Yeah, it's not. Um, I mean, which would I luckily started that in my uh, off season. I primarily work, you know, long hours in the summer and then the winter. Um, I have a little bit more, not necessarily free time. I still work 40 hour weeks, but um I'm not as tired when I get home. So I started Witchwood in October, which coincided with the end of my spray season. So when I came home, I kind of was able to just sit down and ride a couple of hours every day. And that um, riding Witchwood all the way through Seabound um, was October through February. Wow. So if you have time to sit down and write a book, you can crank out a book pretty quick, but it's still gonna take uh, you know, two to three hours every day to do that. Sure. Um, there are some prolific authors. There's a 
release strategy is called rapid release where you write a bunch of books in a short amount of time and then you publish each book like a month apart or if you write i write kind of slow compared to those people so i would have to write an entire series and then sit on it and then release it but i'm a little impatient and once yeah, yeah. i have something finished get the cover art for it i kind of want to put it out there yeah thank you so um I have three kids and, and when you're a parent, you get the luxury of naming your children um, as the creator of, the, of basically three different universes. Um, how do you come up with the names of your characters? Um, with fantasy books or even science fiction, you, you, oftentimes I don't think authors go through a baby name book and pick names. Um, can you talk about the creative process of, of picking some of these names and how they're, how you're inspired to, to come up with them? Um, so for Rebellion, like I said, Lincoln and I had tried to write several other stories. So sometimes the names just transferred over into that. And those ones, I don't really know how we came up with, but um, sometimes a name will just pop out to you and you'll be like, okay, that sounds good. Other times I kind of just poke buttons on the keyboard until I see like a sequence that I like and then add vowels to it yeah. um, to make it something that you can pronounce. Um, for Terra Mortem, that one was a little bit more sci-fi. So um, I kind of looked up names in other countries and then added a different spin to them so that they were still foreign to American readers without being like, they're not like high fantasy names for um, sure and then Witchwood was it's kind of like a western fantasy setting so some of the names are like names that sound like they would fit in the 1800s or 1600s but the main character's name artemisia corax is actually um the latin species and genus for uh sage is artemisia oh, wow. and then Corax is the species for Raven. Okay. So I kind of, sometimes I steal words from um, my day job being a plant manager. So uh, I will I, just mush those together. And I don't think many people will pick up on that unless you study scientific yeah. classes and stuff. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not a botanist or a scientist, but uh, I, I'm surprised I didn't, didn't catch that. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of a, a segue into my next question. So as a librarian, it's easy to classify the Rebellion trilogy as high fantasy or as just fantasy. Um, for Witchwood, I sort of think of it as, and I could be wrong, but I think of it as sort of a dark fantasy or supernatural fantasy. And uh, Terra Mortem, I, I have pegged as clearly science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, um, as an author or as a creator of these universes, is it sort, and you talked about the length of time um, to, to write these books but in your head is it difficult to to navigate from the kingdom of Dirthia to the planet AE625 to the town of Northgate or is it easy for you to com compartmentalize these universes or that once you've finished one you can sort of abandon it and move on to the next place setting? Um, it's definitely easier as you write more to kind of move on to the next. Uh, the Rebellion Trilogy was supposed to be a standalone novel. We didn't end it how you're supposed to end a novel. And then we got inspiration from the Loose Ends for Vengeance, which was supposed to be the end of it. Um, but luckily before we uh, packaged them all together as a duet, we got inspiration for Onslaught. So that's kind of how you can get stuck in one realm, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but once I kind of got through that, it was easier to skip from Terra Mortem um, into the town of Northgate for Witchwood. But um, I tried writing a story that I wasn't too invested in between Witchwood and then what I'm working on now. And I got like 80 pages into it when I said, you know, I'm not, I don't really want to write this anymore. So I'm going to scrap it. And now I'm back into like the Witchwood universe and I'm writing a, kind of standalone sequel with the same characters, but different plots completely so that you could read one before the other. Um, so I guess when you kind of have a universe or setting that you really enjoy, it is hard to get out of that. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Certainly there's plenty of examples at the library of, of authors that get stuck in a realm. And then there's other examples where authors will, will go from one to another. And it's, I think it's funny when, when it offends readers that, that an author has given up um, a certain uh, style or realm that they're writing in and moved on to something else. But I, I think it's a testament to their writing skill and, and, and perhaps just their imagination. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, uh, as a reader, I don't like to read a series that goes on for 20 to 30 books. Yeah. Because um, I want to read a lot of things. I have a pretty extensive to be read shelf. Um, I think I have 150 some odd books at my house that I bought. So I don't like to spend too much time in one uh, universe or realm when I'm reading. So. Yeah. I try to keep that in mind when I'm writing that, you know, sticking around with characters in a setting for 14 books or 14 seasons of the TV series, that's a big time investment. And there's other things that, you know, you want to get out and read. Sure. So I kind of write like that. There's other things I would like to write instead of staying in one place for too long. May I ask what you're, uh, what you're currently reading right now, maybe one or two fiction or nonfiction books that, that are, that's on your bedstand or, that you're looking through? Um, yeah, so I'm actually reading A River Runs Through It because I just got into fly fishing and I just watched the movie, so I figured I should read the book. Um, yeah. And then I have the first book in the Occupied Earth series by Jasper Scott. And I picked that one up because he's on my also box for Terra Mortem, if you look on the Amazon page. So um, my readers also like his books but he has a larger following so his readers also like my books is probably more appropriate to say so i figured i might as well um read somebody who kind of writes along the same lines so that i can kind of see what other people are doing who write similar novels yeah thank you um i used to live in montana and you can actually go to um there's a museum in in helena um, where you can see all of the, uh, um, gosh, Norman McLean. Yeah. Um, his fishing poles and all that, all that stuff. It's really cool to just walk through and actually, um, see this, this, what now we would call ancient fly fishing equipment, mm -hmm. but it's, it's almost poetic to look at that and then yeah. drive down the, up and down the banks of the, the Blackfoot and other rivers and, and it kind of puts you back in that place. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful book. The movie's good too, but the, yeah. the, book, the book is a lot better. They're, they left out a lot of stuff and kind of lost in translation, but they're both good on their own. Just when you compare them to each other, they're a little different. I want to ask a question. So this is the, um, hopefully you can see this. This is the artwork for uh, your, your five books. Um, the, co the library copy of Rebellion, book one in the Rebellion trilogy, um, we actually have a different, uh, we actually have a different cover. Um, but where did this artwork come from? Was it something that you just paid for and had someone commissioned to, to draw these pictures up? Or do you know the story behind um, where that all comes from? Okay, so I, um, for the first Rebellion Trilogy, we published with tape publishing before we found out that there are like publishers who will scam you. Oh. So they are sent out of business. But um, so we published Rebe Rebellion with tape publishing first and then published Vengeance with Book Locker. Yeah. And they're kind of a company who will do the whole package for you. You pay them to do it. But um, if you have no idea what you're doing, that's the way to go. And Book Locker is a good company to use. Um, and so our artists kind of looked at what the original cover was kind of went with something similar until we could get it away from tape publishing and yeah, yeah. Um, then get all the cover art similar so it was the original idea was to go with weapons on the cover of each and then we wanted it to be different with the new publisher so we uh decided to go with like different helmets and headwear and those are actually just like stock images that then they took kind of faded out and fit in with that background. Um, for 
the, my solo novels, I actually commissioned an artist, uh, Tom Edwards. He's from the UK and he does a lot of book covers for very successful authors. Um, so I kind of told him what my general uh, vision was for him. Like Terra Mortem, they crash land on a deserty planet um, and then they kind of leave their initial crash site. So that's like the Exodus scene. Um, and then Witchwood, is it's kind of like that dark fantasy horror witchcraft um and there's werewolves in it so i wanted like the full moon and kind of a forest scene and i think that uh bighorn sheep skulls look pretty cool so i want something with like runes on it on the front and then as i said earlier the artemisia corax the main character's name is the species epithets in latin for sage and raven so there's a sage sprig on one horn of the bighorn sheep and on the other are some raven feathers. Yeah, that's right. Staring at us in the face, and I just never picked up on yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty cool. So I'm pretty proud of that because it's kind of sneaky, but I like to tell people about it. Yeah, yeah. No, I um, no, the, the, especially the Witchwood one. That's that would just be a cool poster to have. That's a, a really cool image. Yeah, that's probably my favorite one. Um. So, which what is your newest book? It, it just came out last year. How long has mm -hmm. the library had this? Um, could you give, without giving away any spoilers, could you give a brief introduction to um, the plot of, of Witchwood and, and maybe why should someone pick it up? Um, okay, so the short blurbs when you're trying to figure out what's on the back of your book are actually the hardest. So um, mm -hmm. I'll do my best on the fly. Um, so there's a string of unexplainable murders in the small town of Northgate. And the sheriff gets kind of the idea that, that it's something that he doesn't have any experience dealing with just the nature of what's happened. So he makes a house call to visit the woods, witch Artemisia and she uh, reluctantly agrees to help him. Um, she's vested in like the well-being of Northgate, but her and the sheriff, her practicing witchcraft and him, you know, upholding the law, obviously butt heads. And then it kind of takes them down this rabbit hole where the sheriff kind of has to take a back seat and let Artemisia do what she does best, which is dealing with demons, the uh, cult, and you know, um, there's a whole pantheon involved in Witchwood that I kind of invented just for the story. So. Uh, the sheriff is kind of at his wit's end when there's demons and gods and werewolves running rampant in this town. Um, and I have to say that I haven't came across a book like Witchwood that I have read. So I've been trying to find some because it would make marketing my own book easier. So uh, I would say that Witchwood just really takes you for a wild ride and it does not end where you think it's going to go or and it just kind of elevates itself throughout the story as the different layers of folklore and mythology are created and kind of condensed into that book. I think if anyone likes reading uh, plot twists or surprises or anything like that, um, they would be um, well fed with any of your books. But yeah, um, which, which one is definitely a, a roller coaster. That's sort of how, how I would envision it. And I, and it's it's a lot of fun. Um, um, I, again, I think I mentioned before, I, I sort of, um, it's got that supernatural universe, so it's a very different kind of fantasy than the Rebellion trilogy. Um, uh, but it is a lot of fun. Um, what, so there's a lot of readers that, that just love fantasy and to a lesser extent science fiction, but uh, how, what would you say to someone who is a reluctant fantasy reader? Um, what is the appeal, sort of maybe the symbolic appeal, or, or what is something that fantasy can do that other genres of fiction just have a harder time with or, or can do better? Um, I think that you can separate from the real world. Um, like sometimes it's nice to read something that does not fit into like uh, the categories that we're used to seeing. Um, like historical fiction you kind of know what's going to happen um there's limitations to stories that are written in a modern setting where 
in fantasy, you kind of get to make up your own rules. And as long as you keep them believable, you can push the limits on what reality your characters experience. So I definitely say it's kind of an escapism um, compared to other reading. Yeah. And I guess it's got to be a lot of fun for to be able to, in the Rebellion Trilogy, to create these um, monsters and creatures and other otherworldly uh, um, things that just don't exist in the real world. And in the Witchwood series, uh, things like demons and stuff like that. Um, it's got to be a lot of fun to, uh, again, create that kind of thing. And... Um, you basically you have to just unlock your imagination right yeah um and when we're when we're creating creatures for the rebellion trilogy we try to make sure there are things that hadn't really been done before so i wanted to kind of carry that over into witchwood even though we have gods and goddesses and the pantheon and demons and werewolves i always want to put my own spin on them kind of like my own little trademark um so that they're still original when you're reading them and which characters would you say you're the most attached to? Um, do you have any, um, uh, the main characters obviously, but are there any that just you really bond with as an author? Or is that something that, that doesn't really happen because they're not real? Um, I grow a little bit attached to all of them. Um, in the Rebellion trilogy, one of my characters had a rivalry with Lincoln's character, who Lincoln's character was the main one. Um, so mine was kind of a secondary, but still played a big role. So they had a rivalry, and through at the end of Witchwood, one of them had to die to end that rivalry. And so uh, my character had to get killed off. So I kind of bartered with Lincoln. I'm like, well, I got to take off this one, this one, this one, this one, to kind of make that fair. But um, as like I've matured as a writer, it's just easier to kind of put your characters into hard situations that, you know, you don't really want to put them in because you like the characters, even though they aren't real. Um, I kind of have a soft spot for all of them. And some of the um, characters who you wouldn't think are some of my favorites, like in uh, Onslaught, uh, there's a character, Kay Fell, and she plays like a very She's a major character in the third book, but that's the only one that she's in. And she's actually one of my all time kind of favorites, just because the way that she's introduced, you don't think she's gonna be who she turns out to be. Um, so I actually kind of like the secondary characters better than the main characters, because you spend so much time with the main characters and you have to make them do some like infuriating things like in Harry Potter, I don't like Harry as a character at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think he's petulant and kind of <laughs> annoying, but um, a lot of people like him, but I usually find myself drawn to kind of the secondary characters who kind of like support that main role. And they might not be the center of focus, but they're still all in for the conflict and are gonna make whatever sacrifices they need to. Yeah. What, where do you write? Do you like to find a quiet spot in your house or can you write with music on in the background? What is your, what is your process when you decide that, okay, I'm gonna spend a couple of hours today writing or hashing out ideas um so i actually don't have an interesting like writing nook or anything i usually write at the kitchen table or in my room um just kind of depends on if i'm writing in the evening or during the day um and i can write if it's loud or quiet if people are talking to me um i'm not as engaged in the conversation with people if i'm trying to write but I can kind of multitask. Sure, sure. I, you know, I guess we we hear about some authors that really have to sequester themselves and and hide in a cabin in the woods. And for some people, that's great. So it's just fascinating to hear uh, different people's techniques. And this I think maybe, if you have children, if you have small children, you probably have to like lock yourself yeah. in a room or something. Yeah. Um, I've only ever had to write around people who are my age or older. So. Sure if I'm not engaged in the conversation or something, then they just kind of go do their own thing. But I think that children are a little more demanding of your attention, so. And this may be a, uh, an obvious question, but when you first started writing Rebellion, did you always write it on a, on a computer? Or did you ever, I dare say, the T word, a typewriter or, or longhand? Um, I used to write in a notebook. Um, 
when I was like in middle school, I had a little spiral notebook for all of my classes to write notes. And I had one for my stories. So uh, by the time that uh, Rebellion came around, I just wrote it on a computer. Um, yeah. I did have a couple short stories that were supposed to be longer stories I wrote when I was little. And then I had to take my notes and try and write them into a computer. And my handwriting is not legible whatsoever. <laughs> um, since I've came to Pagosa and I'm in a professional atmosphere, I write everything in all caps so you can read it. Because in college, I'll, I have a couple of my notebooks from college when I was writing notes. And I can't read like every other word because you're writing fast and just trying to get what's on the you know board down. So the same thing is kind of happens when you're trying to get what's in your head out is that it doesn't come out very clean looking. Yeah. So ho hopefully this happens because it would mean, uh, I guess, a big paycheck. But um, because there seems to be a lack of originality in the movie universe, it seems like every good movie uh, is based off of a, a better book. Would you ever want mm. to see your books made into a movie someday? Or do you think that that would somehow uh, corrupt this, uh, your own universe? Um, I think if they're made into movies, that would be cool. It'd be a lot more exposure and then it would hopefully lead people to my books. Um, I don't think I would be too much of a stickler on keeping with the plot line. Like if they want to do their own little add-ins, um, I kind of enjoy seeing a movie and then watching and then reading the book later and finding out that it's like a much more deeper world and that the book is so much better than the movie. It's disappointing if you've read the book first and then you see the movie, but yeah. um, it's, I think I would be fine with, you know, having it go to the big screen and have the director's own original spin on it. Um, as opposed to like me being, you know, overbearing and, you know, wanting them to stick to what I wrote. Yeah. Um, I think having them a little bit different in two different experiences, kind of a cool thing in the nature of translating a book into a movie. Um, so you you guys have a website, uh, proudbrotherswriting.com. Um, I believe that was correct. Um, yeah, that what, what is the best place that someone could go to if they wanted to purchase one of your books? Um, if they want to purchase a book, they could definitely go to Proud Brothers Writing and under the books tab, you can just click the books and it'll take you to um, a retailer. Um, the Rebellion Trilogy is published wide, meaning that you can find it on Barnes & Noble, Amazon, um, Kobo, which is a Canadian company, whereas um, Terra Mortem and Witchwood are just on Amazon. But if you want to buy paperback, you can definitely just go to uh, bookends here in Pagosa and they carry them. Yeah. And uh, of course, we here at the library, we also have uh, all five of your books. Um, they, I can say that they check out pretty regularly. Um, it's, uh, it's always fun to see um, the local author section action, um, be read and, and get some positive feedback from it. So it's really great. Um, and I think you mentioned earlier that you're currently writing. Um, do you have any idea um, when another book might be finished? Um, I'm thinking by the end of this year, it'll be finished. And then depending on how my cover artist schedule looks, it might be six months until it hits the shelves. Sure. So and we did have one other person uh, uh, join us. Uh, Rebecca, can you hear us? Maybe not. I was gonna give I her. I can hear you. Hey, Rebecca, welcome. Hey. Um, so we actually started a little bit early um, because we were going to, re we were recording this conversation so that others could view it. But uh, do you have any questions for Ethan about writing generally or about uh, anything really? Would he be interested in giving a class on how to write? Um, yeah, I definitely would be interested. Um, yeah, my schedule is pretty flexible in the winter. Um, so I 
actually did speak to the Pagosa Valor School um, two, maybe three years ago now. Um, so I don't know if it'd be like an adult setting or like at a classroom, but um, that's definitely something that I'd be willing to do. No, we could definitely do something um, for a general audience, including adults, or, or even I know um, our team librarian has um, some writing classes or, or writing programs for um, teens. But uh, yeah, that'd be something we'd be open to. Of course, the library is still closed. That's a, a huge bummer for us that it's difficult to have in-person programs right now. But uh, yeah, I'll definitely um, get back with you, Ethan, about uh, some writing workshops or maybe something that we can do. Okay. Um, I wonder if you could spend just a couple of minutes and talk about your, your day job um, uh, fighting noxious weeds and yeah. other things. You're not just, it's the weed and pest supervisor, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So um, we don't do too much with pests other than we're like a first point for resources. Um, I can kind of tell you how to manage most of your um, rodent or insect problems here and then kind of hand you off to somebody who's more experienced. Uh, we don't offer any services for controlling pests um, because we're busy with all the weeds in the county. But um, controlling noxious weeds is definitely an interesting kind of esoteric position because they're, there's introduced species that fit a niche in our environment and they don't take over and degrade the landscape. And then you have invasive species that given the right circumstances can be very aggressive and take over. And then you have noxious, which is a, another categorization, which is a poor term for it because noxious does not mean toxic. Some of them are toxic, but in layman's terms, noxious and toxic are the same. It just means that they're legally mandated by the state that we control them um, because of the huge impacts they have to agriculture, outdoor recreation, human health, and just our native ecosystems. So it's, it's really a fun job. Um, I got into it because I like conservation, not because I want to spray weeds all day, but um, it's cool when you see an area that was completely taken over by a weed and a couple of years later, it starts to look a little bit better and you start to see um, native grasses and plants coming back. And eventually you can kind of turn that land over and just keep monitoring it for when those populations may occur again, because uh, most of the weed species have uh, this extensive seed viability where their seeds can survive for 50 years in the soil before they germinate. Um, and that's kind of one of the criteria for being a noxious weed is that they rep reproduce rapidly, um, produce a ton of seeds, and the seeds are viable for a long time, and that they outcompete native vegetation. Yeah. And to control those, we use a uh, we use mechanical control. If it's a small population of a weed that is not currently in Archuleta County, we like to pull that. Um, and then of course there's herbicides, but there's also biological controls um, where you use insects or fungus from the native um, ranges of these weeds and you introduce it here. Uh, those biocontrols have been studied for like 10 years um, by the animal and plant health inspection uh, I forget what that stands for, but the APHIS division um, before they can be released to make sure they won't have any non-target effects. And right now we're working with a really cool biocontrol agent called Canada thistle rust fungus that is a fungus that only grows on Canada thistle and has had really promising results. Wow. So hopefully we can get that going here. So if someone has concerns about vegetation that's not native, um, should they contact you or should they um, contact the county? How would you recommend that? Um, they could contact me. My office phone is 264-6773 and they can email me pictures. Um, my website is on the, my email is on the county website. They can send pictures. I do property inspections. Um, those are free of charge because if you have a noxious weed, you have to figure out how to control it and then work kind of the natural first step in doing that. Um, so, and that's one of my favorite parts of the job is actually going out and kind of surveying somebody's property with them and telling them 
what next steps they should take if they have an issue and kind of identifying what they need to do to bring that land back to being a healthy status. And uh, like you said, you get to help the, the native vegetation flourish. And I think that's the ultimate goal. So again, we have um, all of your books at the library. I'm only holding up a few of them. Don't forget Tara Mortem. Which one of your books was your uh, favorite to write? Um, they're all my favorite in some way. Um, Tara Mortem, because I usually don't really go too far into sci-fi. Um, I'm yeah. not really techie, so it's kind of cool to kind of put my own spin on the sci-fi genre. Rebellion was really fun because it's spread out over three books and I wrote it with my older brother and um, If you have siblings, you know, you don't always get along. So <laughs> we usually had constructive Conversations that helped us springboard kind of to what needed to happen next and or our arguments kind of took us down to a new plot twist. We didn't neither of us expected um, But I really enjoyed writing Witchwood. Um, I think that Western fantasy kind of setting is probably yeah. my favorite now after writing that. And I just like kind of putting my own knowledge of like native plants and what they do and kind of turning that um, medical effect into something supernatural that could be used um, by the characters to combat these demons and other dark forces that were assailing their town. So you mentioned plot twists, and there are many. Um, when you first drafted the book, did you have a good idea of how the beginning, middle, and end would play out? And did you find yourself um, freely changing your drafted plot, or did you just kind of go with it with just a loose, rough outline? Um, so I fly by the seat of my pants. I do not write an outline. I kind of start with like a scene or something in my head of how I want it to go and then build from there. Uh, writing Rebellion, I didn't take any notes. Um, me and Lincoln just kind of spitballed ideas. And so it kind of just went from there. So we don't have anything to really trace like what we had planned on doing other than our first draft of Rebellion. The last half of the book is wildly different from uh, what is out there and published. Um, but for Terra Mortem and Witchwood, I do write down kind of a couple chapters ahead of myself, like a one sentence, what I want to happen. And then I write notes, like maybe this character should do this somewhere along the line, or like this is the scene I had in my head. And it's always funny when I open up um, that little journal to see where I'm going and then flip back a couple pages and realize I left something out because I decided to go a completely different pathway. And then if it's a good idea, try and still wrangle that back into it. So I usually don't have a clear uh, beginning, middle, and end, but I usually have like a clear beginning, middle, or end. Like there's one of those is kind of the goal that I need to get to. Um, in Rebellion, we had a, it was a middle scene that I kind of pictured for Rebellion, and then we had to figure out what happened after that. So that let us, gave us a lot of like uh, creative room. For Terra Mortem, I kind of had the end was, where I wanted to get to. So Terra Mortem was a little, a little bit more challenging to write. If you know where the beginning or middle should be, um, the end is pretty easy to come naturally. But if you are working towards a certain end, that's a little bit more difficult. And then which would, I just had kind of the concepts figured out. And so that one was, um, earlier you said it was, you would describe it as a roller coaster. And that was kind of a roller coaster to write because I kind of get a couple chapters ahead of myself and know what was happening. And it wasn't until the middle of the book that I really had like a clear vision of the end. And when I finished Witchwood, there was a character who their story wasn't completely finished. And my mom asked, you know, well, what about so-and-so? And that's where Seabound came into play. So I finished Witchwood, she read it, edited it. And then she asked me about that. So I sat down immediately and started writing Seabound. Right. Yeah, so which would and see bound the uh, oh, I had it before. Uh, this is rough. Roughly sea bounds like the lap the uh, you can't see that very well. It doesn't take up much of the book, but it's it's a great uh, a great addition to to the rest of the story, but it's independent. 
Yeah. Um, so uh, again, with us was uh, Ethan Proud. Ethan lives here in Pagosa Springs, and uh, he's been gracious enough with his time to answer a few questions. And we hope uh, those that view this video later will um, um, feel inspired to come check out his books, either buy them or uh, stop by the library and pick one up. And, um, and you can contact Ethan through the county website. Uh, in closing, was there anything that you'd like to um, share or, or, or promote about your books? Um, I would just uh, say that they're at uh, bookends. So if you want to shop local, okay. there is that option. And if you do enjoy um, the books, like leave a review because that's how they gain traction and get more readers. So that's always helpful for an author is for the readers to leave good reviews. Great. Well, thank you, Ethan, and um, thanks for thanks for being with us tonight. Yeah, thank you for uh, asking me to do this. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. Have a wonderful evening, everybody.